afternoon and I was in fact listening to Dr. Varma and it was an amazing lecture and you know what I'm going to do now is to I guess shift gears completely to what is uh, you know on the mental health side to basic you know, organic problems of the brain as a structure as a you know so let me just uh, get on with it and uh, I'll just share my slides what COVID pandemic has also taught us over the last four months or so, ever since we've been deeply involved with it, is that it's much beyond the lungs, the cough, the fever, the chills. So we know that probably the, the, the organ which is most frequently and most enormously affected after the lungs is probably the nervous system. And we have now a huge evidence which has emerged, still emerging, and I must insist again that we still are on a learning curve. So what we do know is, you know, because the, the audience is largely, you know, non-core medical, so therefore I'll, I'll keep it as simple as possible and uh, try to impart what, whatever I know to you because I've learned a lot in uh, Dr. Verma's lecture and, you know, great insights, you know. So there is something called an ACE2 receptor, which is a uniform receptor and it's present in a lot of you know, systems in the body, just not in the lungs or in the respiratory system. And that's the receptor that this virus targets. And there is some commonality out of all the coronaviruses that you have heard about. I'm sure you heard about the SARS, you know, the, 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 the swine flus and the MERS. And these were all big epidemics when they came in and then they, then they just went away. But this one, the COVID-19, turns out to be markedly different. And it, it's just that the entry into human cells was this blessed receptor and something called a spike protein. And we keep hearing about it because this is the basis for all our testing. And you must have heard about this testing business, how you need to ramp every time. And also the great thing, which is now, uh, very much on the horizon universally and probably India has uh, you know a couple of steps uh, even uh, probably further than the rest of the world in terms of vaccine so we will talk about that as well now, the global distribution of COVID-19 have left it blank because each day the numbers are growing so now with an experience of more than 13 million cases and we have nearly seven like deaths and in India itself have more than so we do have a fair amount of insight into how this virus is behaving and why it's causing so much of a brain and mental problems. So the manifestations of COVID-19, and you must have heard about this day in and day out, the electronic, the print media, how to recognize it, basically saying it's a flu. And we have these politicians who said, oh, it's just a flu and now you know that it's just not a flu. So we have this fever, cough, and shortness, and fatigue, and then you have some lab parameters, but we've gone much, much beyond that now. So the diagnosis of COVID-19 is essentially targeting this viral particles. So initially you heard of this in you know, RT-PCR, where they put in that swab into the nostril, go and, you know, get that material from the back of your throat and then you test for the presence of virus doing an RT-PCR. And now we know that there are other ways. So there is a method of diagnosing tuberculosis. So there's a kit called the CBNAT and TrueNAT technique, which is also now there with us. And then we also now are testing simple antigen. The relevance of these tests are that RT-PCR is it's giving you a result over a period of a day, maybe even later. And in, you know, in, in uh, places where they are done in a bulk, maybe you'll get it in about a couple of, you know, maybe 12 hours, not less than eight hours. CBNAT and TrueNAT would be for two hours and an antigen test is 15 minutes. And this is of great relevance to a clinician, say uh, a stroke person like me or any other, you know, clinician who's, who is, in dealing with the emergency cases where you're actually you know, looking at a life and death which, and you need to intervene, you need these tests ASAP because that would determine the amount of protection which is 
needed, not just for patient and the caregiver, the rest of the patients, the rest of the wards, the rest of the infrastructure, but also for the healthcare workers. It becomes mandatory and, and imperative. So looking beyond fever and cough, I mean, the logical aspects of COVID, we probably had some... Probably 30,000 odd cases which appeared from China. So most of these initial inputs were from the Chinese and their admitted patients. And they found these neurological features in terms of some headaches, you know, some amount of loss of smell, some amount of loss of taste and giddiness and not feeling okay. And also most severe neurological features like going into coma, developing strokes or brain attacks and so on and so forth. But they noticed these in those individuals who were admitted in the hospital with COVID-19, essentially with COVID-19 related lung problems such as pneumonia. And then they said that this may be because the virus is entering the brain. You know that there is this anosmia or loss of smell and agusia or loss of taste are now recognized features in the symptomatology of how to recognize that one may have a COVID-19 infection. This is irrespective and even in the absence of fever, cough, chills, sore throat, or what have you. So then they realized that this virus is entering the brain through the peripheral nerves, which carry the sensation of smell. And that's how it enters through the olfactory system. So that may be one reason. And and also they felt that this is one of the reasons why they also develop a shortness of breath because the respiratory center or the control place in the brain may be getting affected by it. Then came the clinical evidence. So they found that they could be meningitis, they could be encephalitis, they could be paralysis. And later on, the American Academy of Otolaryngology, then the Neurology, then the Heart Association, and then everybody else, and the CDC and now India, we've listed an osmia, hyposmia, and dysgeusia, or an alteration in taste, or a loss of taste, as important screening symptoms into what we call as a flu screen, now to recognize or to suspect if someone has a COVID-19 infection. So the the series of neurological manifestations just started appearing from April 2020. And, you know, ladies and gentlemen, you, you know, this, this pandemic is, seems like it's been there with us for a decade now, because every single day you have something new coming in. April, when was April? Two months ago. And, and we moved away from this April as well. And now in July, July coming, end of July, whole lot has even gone beyond what we know, what we had known in April 2020. So the first case series appeared in April and then in May, where they found that in admitted patients, almost 40% had developed problems because of affection of the brain. This could be just dizziness. Headache seems to be all pervading. And please remember, headache is the universal complaint of mankind. I'm sure even animals have it probably. They don't know how to express that. However, I feel whoever has a head has a headache sometime in their life said that these headaches are a little different and various way, you know, the, the spectrum of the severity of the loss of consciousness in terms of just being confused, maybe delirious, maybe disoriented to frank, straight coma, strokes, ataxia, ataxia is imbalance various methods of seizures, of fits, and of course, the peripheral nervous system in terms of loss of smell, loss of taste, and then a whole lot of paralysis. And you should remember the ACE2 receptor. Now that's there even in the muscles. So they also develop a lot of myalgias, aches and pains in the body. So that's again, a very common flu-like feature. And they've also seen that people, now this is a CT scan of the brain, and those people who present with strokes, these are the dark things that you see. Now, these are the areas where there's no blood supply. So these are the classic strokes. And in these individuals, when they did a CT scan of the chest, they found this peripheral white spots, which are essentially the presence of bilateral bronchopneumonia, which is classically seen in COVID-19 infection. Then let's look at, are there any 
have parameters. If supposing somebody has a COVID-19 infection and they do this normal hemogram, are there some features in the blood test which will be a red flag, which put up your antenna and say like, oh, now these, this person may be developing a nervous system problem. In that, they found that the, the peripheral lymphocyte count, now that, that's really way beyond low. So very severe lymphopenia sort of sets apart this COVID-19, which has a predilection to involve the nervous system. Also, they found a little bit of kidney issues and platelets are also low. So there's another paper which came up in Lancet, which is, you know, one of our best papers that we have in medicine. And here they found that about 11 of the admitted patients just developed strokes during admission strokes with this lack of blood supply to the brain. And then there was another paper again from China. This again showed that 40% of these people had developed strokes which was almost 13.5%. They were all severely ill patients. So the initial reports all came in saying that severely ill, those in the ICU are, are the ones who develop bad neurological problems, such as especially strokes. So strokes had become one of the commonest manifestations of a severely you know, ill COVID-19 patient who was admitted in the hospital. And they found that in such patients, they were generally older, they had comorbid conditions like blood pressure, diabetes, previous strokes, previous heart attacks, cancers, and so on and so forth. And that's what we keep hearing, that be careful about your elderly, because be careful if you have diabetes or hypertension, because that's the age and comorbid conditions where if you get COVID, then you're liable to develop a more serious affliction. So this seemed like a no-brainer. This we already know. What actually has happened then when, when you summarize, they found that 40% admitted patient had nervous system. Please remember, 40% is huge. It's a huge percentage. Most of them were elderly. Most had comorbid conditions. And a lot of them did have fever, cough, and anorexia. Then they went on to develop these nervous system manifestations. And the milder ones were dizziness and headache or some imbalance balance but predominantly there was this altered mentation some confusion some lethargy some amount of disorientation in a lot of them right but then apart from strokes and encephalopathies you know some of them they actually came in with a stroke so in them they didn't have a fever cough or anorexia so these presentations came a little later in the may and later part of may publications they started finding that these guys didn't have fever and headache. They just presented as an acute stroke to the hospital. And once they were admitted, then they develop fever, cough, anorexia, or on chest X-ray, they develop typical lung lesions. And that's how COVID-19 was suspected. COVID-19 was tested. And then they were proven to be COVID-19. So please remember, this set of patients were not even suspected to have COVID-19 because they didn't have classical features. They came in as strokes. You don't suspect a heart attack or a brain attack patient who goes to your emergency that he's COVID-19. He never had any fever, cough, chills, sore throat, what have you. But once they're admitted, because they're not going through COVID screen, nobody's wearing a PPE, nobody's taking any precautions, they're coming to a general ward where they're being managed as strokes and then they turn out to be COVID-19 and then all, all hell breaks loose. So this happened. And in then they found that beside lower lymphocyte count, there were other lab parameters such as CRP. This is a very frequently done inflammatory biomarker, which we use. We found that this is really, really high. And some D-dimer levels, you know, D-dimer, LFT, RR, which are the liver, kidney function derangements were supposedly also said to be prominently there, especially what is called as a D-dimer. Please remember, D dimer indicates a coagulation or clotting, blood clotting problems. So, in the lab features, as we said before, all these were supposedly more with the CNS features. And then they summarized at that time, that was May 2020, they found headache, malaise, fatigue, imbalance, e even in the absence of fever, cough, or shortness of breath, smell, taste problems, strokes, paralysis encephalitis or in a way 
various varieties of brain fevers or post fever, what we call as the acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. These are the post viral problems, autoimmune diseases, and also various types of neuropathies. And the hypothesized reasons were that this ACE2 receptor was there not just in the respiratory system, it was there in the brain. It was there in the gastrointestinal system. It was there in the muscles, various other places in the body. So therefore, that could be one reason why. And when they had autopsy studies, now probably we have a little more autopsy studies and some path data which is coming out. And recently, we also found that there was this virus which was seen in the CSF. That is the lumbar puncture. When you take out the fluid, they actually found viruses there. They found viral signatures present in the autopsy specimens as well. Not so much in those previous SARS and MERS, but more so in COVID-19. So this may be a reason. And we know that through the peripheral nervous system is actually entering the brain. That's another reason why. And low lymphocyte counts means that there is a bad immune suppression. Now, this is one phenomena. So when there is an immune suppression, there's a severe CMS features. Maybe that's one reason. High D-dimer means that there is increased tendency to clotting as well as bleeding. Coronis causes consumptive coagulopathy. And if you've been hearing some of, you've been reading some of, you know, the even on Twitter and even on, you know, the, the uh, general public a fora that you find a lot of clotting in the lungs. They're finding this deep venous thrombosis that there is clotting problem happening in the entire body. So that's part of consumptive coagulopathy. And there is high CPK LDH. Now these are the biomarkers for a muzzle. So there is muzzle injury. There is an infection mediated problems. Now infection can cause, you know, have you heard of cytokine storms? You must have heard about it. The the use of tocilizumab. Now you have the, you know, the recently we have an Indian make of tocilizumab, which is which has recently been, uh, you know, uh, given an approval by the DCGI, which is much less costly. So something to tackle the cytokine storm because this is one of those things wherein the body mounts a defense because there is an offense by the virus, and this defense is way beyond what is necessary. Okay, so when it does, it's going to kill even the normal cells in the human body. So that's, that's called the cytokine storm. And this to prevent or to mitigate the storm, there are certain, you know, the uh, therapeutic modalities which are now into the guidelines, which all of us are actually uh, following in our uh, COVID care set. And you know, AIMS is a, a very big COVID uh, care center. We, I think till date, we have around 5,060 COVID patients that we have managed so far of the, them. Almost uh, uh, 1,100 uh, were on ventilators. So uh, at least AIMS Delhi has a, a huge data of managing this COVID uh, patients. And the other is also that the signs and symptoms observed were also because of low oxygen, respiratory acidosis. If, you know, some of you can understand these terms and, you know, multi often dysfunction sepsis is where there's infection all over the body. And, you know, you must have heard of what is called as a sepsis. There is, you know, the, the bloodstream has this infection and even certain medications can, can cause this kind of a confusion. So when they looked at stroke, as I said before, stroke is one of the commonest, commonest manifestation of COVID-19 in the brain. Stroke, brain attack, sudden stoppage of blood supply or the blood vessel is breaking and causing the bleeding. Now, initially, they all thought, oh, it is an older patient. Oh, the patient has diabetes, he's a smoker, he's a hypertensive, he's prone to strokes, and with COVID-19, he's had a stroke. Then they found, especially there was one large series which came out. Initial thing was from Texas, and then we have this huge data which came out from New York. In there, you know, this big sample, and also, so from Italy, about 138 patients, and they found that largely they were younger. They were just about 30, 40 years old, no diabetes, no hypertension, nothing, zilch, but they just would have a mild or COVID symptoms. Then they would, in fact, a lot of them were on home quarantine. They would develop this thrombosis and boom, they're dead. So this could happen both in the heart and the brain. So they found that a large amount of ischemic strokes were actually happening in young people. And there, this 
then the treatment paradigms also changed and now they have gone on to giving a blood thinner from moderately severe COVID-19 patients onwards. So that's in the treatment protocol now. As I said before, even heart is involved and the heart could be because of a direct muscle injury. A lot of problems in the rhythm. The heart rate becomes high, it may become low, it may become irregular. So arrhythmias are known, heart failure has been reported. And if you've heard of the term atherosclerosis, so there is a plaque which can get destabilized. So there'll be little clots which go from the heart called as cardiabolic. So they travel through the bloodstream, they can go to different organs in the body, they can go to the brain as well. So these may be one of the reasons why there could be a stroke. And so even if you didn't have the comorbid conditions, it could still sometimes cause strokes. And for that, they said that maybe it's inflammation itself. Any infection can, can cause some kind of inflammation. And inflammation strokes are a very complicated relationship. I don't want to get into it. But that's known to trigger as well as accelerate the process of getting stroke. And these, the cytokine storm have implicated a lot of these big markers. Interleukins, TNF-alpha. And interleukin-6, in fact, is being routinely measured in a severely ill ICU-admitted patients of COVID-19. This is seen in our ICUs. And whenever IL-6 is elevated, we go ahead and give tocilizumab, which is actually tackling this IL-6 to come down so that it helps in mitigating the cytokine storm. The prothrombotic state is what I said. Prothrombotic means tendency to clot. The blood gets clotted, whether it's heart or the brain or the kidney or in the lungs. And hence, people have started the anti-clotting medication, which is also now got into the routine protocol of managing COVID-19 patients. Infections per se can cause, you know, even influenza, herpes, HIV, the AIDS virus, all these viruses have a tendency to cause strokes. So perhaps that's one of the reasons why COVID-19 also has this tendency to cause strokes. So this sort of summarizes all the neurological problems in COVID-19. So it could have an altered mental status in terms of senses, confusion, disorientation to coma. You could have a direct encephalitis, that is infection of the brain, or it could be meningitis, that is the coverings of the brain, strokes, anosma aguseia, Guillain Barre syndrome is one of the you know, varieties of neuropathies and acute paralysis. So they're okay, and the next two, three days, they're totally paralyzed from neck down. And this is seen to be post infectious or the post infection. Now, the post infection COVID 19 survivors has become a big cohort of research because of the implication of the brain. Because of the fact that the, the somehow has gained entry into the brain, now they say that maybe these survivors over the next few months, maybe a year, maybe they develop some kind of a degeneration. Maybe they develop these mental health issues, including a host of neuropsychiatric. And, and hence, there is the big ongoing research in the cohort, which is being developed, which is multinational, which is being uh, you know, uh, managed by the, uh, the university in Texas, US, the San Antonio, there, they're actually, uh, you know, getting this whole the number of countries, including China and India, wherein the COVID survivors are going to be followed up using the scales of what is called as, you know, they have, they have, uh, several of these neuropsychological batteries, as well as functional imaging and structural imaging and neurological evaluation, whether they're de developing something like a Parkinson's whether they're developing dementia, whether they're developing some mental health issues, including what is specific for the COVID-19, not because of lockdown, not because of various other you know, social or anthropological issues, sheer infection of the brain. This is also now in process and probably we'll get some answers over the next few months. So the SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID-19 have a systemic disease that is involvement of the lungs, of the kidney, of the gastrointestinal system. So you have you know, low oxygen, you have therefore brain being involved, or a clotting, strokes, just inflammation, infection of the brain, the 
nerves. So you get encephalitis and in children, you must have heard that there is something called Kawasaki-like syndrome. You know now that even infants sometimes can get infected. Pregnant ladies can get infected. Direct brain infection causing encephalitis. The peripheral nervous system muscle infection, muscle involvement causing cell death. And the post-infectious, the COVID-19 survivors because of immune-mediated issues or post-infectious problems causing paralysis as well as here we're going to add on the neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative phenomena as well. Now, this is the last of my parts that I just wanted to tell you that how are we managing people who are coming with emergencies? So you've seen that in the last four or five months, the whole system, whether it is health infrastructure, whether it is healthcare personnel, in fact, the whole thing has just been COVID specific. It's all COVID and COVID and COVID. So what's happening to our heart attacks, our cancers, our brain attacks, our other infections and other flus and pregnancies and deliveries and children, what's happening to them? So once the, when there was a lockdown and you were completely in your home, you couldn't get out. So when actually people had problems, they didn't know how to get out. They didn't even know how to call for an ambulance. They didn't know which hospital to go and how to approach. So there were problems at each end. So in fact, in the initial period, we found that the heart attacks, brain attacks simply disappeared. They were not coming. Why? Not because they were not happening, but because of all these factors. And then it start, started to you know, ease out. And then we had these you know, things that people got, okay, now let's go. So they were actually only coming the only good thing that happened in the lockdown was that we, we hardly had any road tra traffic accidents because there was no traffic. And once the lockdown is, now we have enough road traffic accidents as well. So once there is an emergency, there's a life-threatening emergency, people would come. Anything which is mild or something that they could say that, oh, let me sleep over it. Let me do some, you know, just my desi remedy and let me get over, they would not reach out to, to any hospital because there was always a fear that you went to hospital, you would catch infection. That said, even if they had gone, they took their own car, they reached a the hospital, the hospitals were all COVID. So they would then refer them to somewhere else saying that, look, we only deal with COVID, go somewhere else. So there were a lot of, a lot of issues. Now they've eased out and we brought in what is called as a telemedicine. So this is telestroke because I'm a stroke person. I'm running this telestroke. But telemedicine essentially was connecting with patients so that they could reach out through their just telephones or video or WhatsApp or what have you, which we've been doing now since March. And we've actually managed to see about 8,000 patients this way. From their home, they could connect and a lot of problems or follow problems. There wouldn't be an issue at all. And we would actually screen and tell them, look, that's an emergency. You come. So that was possible. And we talk about a brain attack. Now, please remember that brain attack is an emergency. There are three emergencies in your lifetime. Please remember this, which are extremely time sensitive. One is the golden hour of trauma, road traffic accident. You need to run and you're aware of that thing called a golden hour. The number two is brain attack or a stroke. There's a clogged artery that clot has to be taken out. Every minute, there are zillions of neurons which are lost forever. You can't do that. The third is your heart attack. So these are the only three time-sensitive emergencies for health system. So in which case, what are the dynamics in the COVID-19? They do come to your emergency. And if you're looking at an emergency wherein the COVID is also coming and there's a non-COVID emergency coming, how are you going to do that? So we dealt with it and we brought out what is called called as a protected cold stroke. So in this protected cold stroke, essentially there is something called a flu screen, which we're doing in our OPDs, which we do it in an emergency very quickly. There is someone who would actually do this. The patient doesn't know. In fact, earlier we also had a travel history. Now we don't, we have done away with that. And then what we do is, a, is what is called as a protected cold stroke. Essentially, instead of having six people in the emergency, there are two people. And they wear their PPEs as a personal protection equipment for them, as well as the patient and the caregiver who are masked. And all procedures which produce an aerosol, they are minimized 
we have developed our green corridors where we quickly taken the patient to a plain CT scan. That is done whether it's COVID, yes or no. And immediately we give the IV thrombolysis to unclot the artery. Subsequently, when there is an intervention needed, maybe a surgery, maybe a putting a catheter in, all those would need a COVID testing. We do the antigen, which we get in 15 minutes, COVID positive, they go to the COVID specific area. Otherwise, they come to our holding area. And once they're, you know, they're proven they're negative, they come to, the, to our stroke unit. We've developed these corridors. There's one left which is dedicated for that so that we don't have to keep sanitizing. We don't have to send our infrastructure to quarantine all the time. Otherwise, our healthcare personnel would be very, very limited. This we've been doing. I'm not getting into uh, you know, detail about it, but I thought you should know that this is happening in Delhi, in your own hospital, and the, all these corridors are fully functional. This is called protected code stroke and similar protected code MI, protected code cancer. These are the frameworks which are invoked to be able to deal with the non-COVID emergencies which are still there in our population. Okay, so I think uh, uh, we've also brought out certain guidelines and consensus statements for India for both what is called as multiple sclerosis. These are demyelinating diseases which are specific and hitting very young people, you know, young executives between the age groups of 20 and 40. These are the young population. For them, we brought out the guidelines. We also got, this is, this is uh, you know, uh, it's a free paper. This we brought out in May, we've also got out the consensus guidelines of how to manage stroke in COVID pandemic in India. This is also published. The most important implications, why I brought this out is, you see, unless we're aware of them, we won't look for them. So we may feel that this is not COVID. The clinician may feel it's non-COVID. So they get managed in a non-COVID area and infect themselves, infect others. They don't get COVID treatment. They infect the healthcare. They infect their own family. So in fact, a lot of them are actually super spreaders because they are being managed as COVID, non-COVID when actually they're COVID positive. So it's very, very important to understand the non-respiratory issues. And since brain is the second most important you know, organ which is being affected, we should be aware of it. Have your antenna up, get your red flags. I think these red flags are now more, much more than what we knew in May 2020. And now that the testing has also been ramped up so immensely, whenever there is a suspicion, go get tested. It is important. And uh, okay, so Mr. Erroneous diagnosis will prove pretty, pretty, pretty expensive. So we shouldn't do that. So, and again, never ever give up on anybody with a brain problem. Thank you.